Hi everybody, so excited to be joining here, you guys tonight with Jackie Angle. Where are you at, Jackie? There you are, hello. Okay. Um, Jackie, can you request to join the video? Amazing. Are we here? Hi. 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 So long. I haven't seen you in so long. Jackie, it's really been years. I really miss you. It's How are you? I can't believe we have to do this to talk. I know. Well, I guess you and I should catch up later. <laughs> <laughs> we, Elisa and I go way back. Wait, I don't know what year was it? Like 20? Sorry, I'm just trying to adjust this. There we go. It's got a new... I got a, I got a new light and a whole new thing and a whole. Twenty fourteen. Twenty. Oh my gosh! Yeah, twenty fourteen. That's crazy. Twenty three. Oh, so it's nine, nearly nine years, ten years. No. Yeah. I probably That's knew. Wild. Yeah, because I I had come back from Israel in twenty thirteen, and then I met you that summer. Yeah. Oh, there Maybe. you go. Twenty thirteen. So it's nearly ten years. Oh my gosh. That makes you feel old, right? I feel really old. But we've seen each other since then. We've worked yes, together yes. closely for many years. And, yes. um, and yeah, I guess our, our paths have always kind of crossed in Judaism, like mental health. And, and, and here we are. More about your, why don't you tell us a bit more about you, what you're up to now, and yeah. yourself to the audience, and then we can talk more about our story. It's so funny, because we kind of, yeah, had a bit of a parallel, like that we both started off with the Jewish passion, Jewish spirituality, but Elisa and I were working for a program called Sold that I started in New York City a long time ago, which is women's empowerment and spirituality and Judaism. And, and then after years of spirituality and spiritual learning, going back to my roots, which was psychology, because I, I went away from that as a psychologist, and then integrating the two, which has just been so amazing. And I love it, yeah. integrating the spirituality with the psychology together and really feeling that that's our tikkun. Yeah. Our tikkun is really this holistic view that we should come from and work through the emotional, psychological issues are part of our spiritual purpose and spiritual growth. I mean, and I'm going to interrupt you for a second. The, the tikkun that Jackie is talking about is our way of kind of entering the world and would you call it like a fixing? How, what would be the English translation of that word? Yeah, thing? like the, the, the things you're here to fix about yourself yeah. or correct about yourself, soul correction, a fixing tikkun really means fix, I guess. But like, yeah, to be able to, that we're, the, the premise is that we're here on the planet and there's certain things that every person has to uh, grow through evolve shift to become more whole for them and that's different for every person and so that's what we call tikkun there's certain things that you can't really outrun your tikkun or dodge it and it's usually connected to stuff in your family that's why you were put in the family you were put into was yeah. because it created even the strengths and the lacks create the, the 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 landscape for your tikkun and then you grow up and you survive whatever you survive right because we all survive something at some point and then you get into your adulthood and then all of a sudden you might see certain patterns play out in your adult life that reflect certain dynamics from your childhood. And you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this again. Right. And then that's the opportunity for the healing to happen where we can become more whole. And that was all purposeful for you to become your greatest version of yourself. So what I love is that in the Jewish world, sometimes the spirituality is separate from the psychology. It's kept separate. Yeah. And I don't work that way anymore. I work with it all together. And I, I'm sure you do too in, in different ways. Yeah. And, um, and so that's what I'm doing is I really put those two things together. And I'm working it within a dating realm now because my personal tikkun, just being a little bit candid with everyone and personal, it's just you and me that like, talk to the world, um, was that I was single for many, many, many years. And so my own journey of struggle and adversity was through this particular tikkun of being single and going through the ups and downs and the despair. And, the, and you, you saw me, you watched me do it. Yeah. Um, and many years later, you know, I kind of did a, did a deal with God once and said that, you know, if you, if you help me get married, I'll, I'll give back to singles. Oh. And um, I didn't really get round to it so quickly. And then it kind of fell in my lap in a really obvious way. I went, oh, okay, okay. So that's what I'm doing. So a long story short, I am now helping a lot of single Jewish women, particularly. Um, yeah, basically 
look into themselves and look at part of the design of being single that is on purpose. It's not a mistake. You haven't been forgotten. God doesn't hate you. You're not being punished right, is part of your making yourself great. And how can we view it from that mindset rather than what's wrong with me? I'm single, no one loves me. And all the anxiety that comes with that, which we're going to also touch on tonight because you are yeah. the expert. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and what about you? What are you doing? And how did this whole the Jewish flavor and the Jewish spirituality influence what you're doing? And, and what are you doing primarily now? Oh, my gosh. I love that we're talking about this. First of all, I'm inspired just hearing you share this because I think it's a very validating conversation for everybody. All of us have gone through challenges in our childhood that have laid the foundation for the challenges that we have in our adult lives. And if we do not look them in the eye, they will keep coming back to us and things do not go away until they are healed. And yeah. it's really crazy that that is like a foundational rule of life. It doesn't, nobody right. gets out of it. Nobody right. gets can't get out of it. Can't. You can't escape it and go, oh, that was in the past. No, right. no, no, it's in you now. Yeah, and it will come right. back. You look at like dead in the eye, and you're like, "Fine, finally, we're gonna deal with it." Um, but I know that your journey had a lot of dealing with it, you know, within relationships and within dating and within what you went through. Yeah. And it's amazing that you're now giving that back to the world. Um, and what I'm up to now is I'm a therapist in the city. My practice is in Midtown East. It's amazing. I have really wonderful people working with me. Um, it's a great little crew. And we help people with anxiety, depression, life transitions, a lot of relationship stuff as well. And I think like probably the biggest thing that I help people recognize is that your emotions are, they're going to be a part of your life, whether you try to deny them or not. And trying to deny them and push them down and push them away will only make them kind of, you know, be so much more exacerbated. And instead, if we validate them, no matter what they are, you will be able to work through them and you will be able to get to the other side. And, you know, as what you we resist persists is my yeah. favorite line. Yeah. yeah. What we resist persists. And I think with dating and with the struggle of dating, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of, you know, feelings of inferiority, whatever it is. And it's like, those are exactly the emotions we need to look straight in the eye in yeah. order to get the other side. So I'm a therapist. I'm practicing here in the city. Um, I work with adults, young adults, and some teens as well. And I love them. And that's it. That's what I'm up to, Jackie. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Um, how do you practice? What do you like to, what sort of modalities do you use? Um, so I use a lot of evidence-based approaches. So a lot of CBT and DBT. I'm a big fan of DBT these days and really incorporating the concept of dialectics. I can, both of these things can exist. I can really want to be married and I can really love the fact that right now being unmarried is the time for me to grow in my own self and my own worth. Um, I can be really, really angry and also grateful about other parts of my life. So that's the, the DBT side. Um, and there's Holding the paradox, the paradox. Exactly. And there's a lot of attachment stuff that comes up too. And using attachment theory, anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, ambivalent, which most of us have a little flavor of both in there is a lot of what I do as well when it comes cool. to relationships. So that's, yeah, that's that. Awesome. Yay. I'm so proud of you. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I nearly am. All right. I, I just, Thank you. That makes me happy. I've seen you develop and we've all gone through iterations of life and it's just been yeah, awesome to see you th like flourish and thrive and you're helping so many people now. So in the beginning when I was in undergrad, that's when I think I yeah. started. Yes. And yes. I was like learning about all these, you know, topics in psychology for the first time. And I'm like, holy smokes, this is real. And this, there's something we can do about it. And there are things we can learn. And then obviously through grad school and yeah now here we are but i think people are asking some good questions and are they already yeah uh how to deal with rejection and how do you not lose hope when you can't find somebody when the feeling of loneliness kind of kicks in yes but okay. I, let's, let's get to it a question of mine that i have in in terms of dealing with individuals who are struggling with relationships and dating and loneliness wh what are some of the common themes that you see the most with loneliness specifically or just in dating you mean yeah, like people who are struggling with this whole chapter of life. Like, are there specific storylines that we tell ourselves uh, or sets or things that, that come up that you notice the most? I think people feel very lonely in those emotions. So what are patterns that you've recognized? Um, there's no good guys out there is one of the most common ones I hear. Yeah. Right? Um, and 
everyone's experience of dating is different, yet there's universal themes, as you said. So there's no good guys out there or all the guys I get are so not in my ballpark that it makes me feel so depressed. So despair, depression. Um, the biggest thing is jumping into the future. What does this mean for me? It's never going to happen. Yeah, we call I, writing, writing the end of the story. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's a great line. Yeah, everyone does that. And uh, my biggest thing is to get women to sit in the present, stay in the present, don't go into the future, obviously dealing with anxiety. That's a really common strategy also, yeah. right? Stay in the present, stay in the present. But I, what I, what I do, what I try to help people shift within the mindset <clears throat> is that, you know, even again from the Jewish sources that the, the external reality mirrors our internal reality in some form. So the Talmud says we don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. So there's a direct connection between what's going on in our life externally and how we view it and how we experience it. And so the good news about that is that you can do something about it. And if you, if you shift from there's no good guys out there, which puts you in victim mode, right? I can't do anything about that if there's no good guys, which is not true, by the way, because the next person's getting good guys suggested. So how can it be one person's getting good guys suggested and you're not, right? So, so there's some dynamic there that's being created and resonating. And so if you shift from that, idea of uh it's not about what's out there it's like if I, if no one's showing up for me how am i not showing up for myself mm. and there's sometimes a mirror between some of those dynamics and the more i've seen it over and over in my course that when the women start owning who they are feeling worthy regardless of regardless of getting married they're worthy yeah. all of a sudden i just got it today i got a message today from someone who finished the course a few weeks ago and she goes literally quote I have had more suggestions in the past three weeks than in the past three years. Wow. Julie literally just said that because she shifted and all of a sudden it came flooding in. So I just see it over and over and over again that we have more power over our situation than we realize. It's not magic. It's not a quick fix. You can't just go, oh, do this, 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 and then it's going to happen. But there is a lot of influence that we can have. So that's hopeful. It's not despairing. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's a big a big way to look at like, what are my patterns in dating? And then where am I doing that for myself? Yeah. Or where am I not doing that for myself? And so yeah. that's really the starting point where I start with people, for example. Not that that's the re and but I have to say this, I have to put a disclaimer. You can never know why you're not married. So you can never point to this pattern and go, oh, that's why I'm not married. And it can't be that it's, there's something wrong with you and yeah. that's why you're not married. And well, what's the proof? What's the proof of that? how many more dysfunctional people than you are married? Oh yeah. <laughs> like millions. So like so <laughs> many dysfunctional people are married. So it can't be that the deciding factor is that you're not healthy enough. Right. So that's why, or you've got issues or there's something wrong with you. Right. That's why one of my, one of my talks I give that everyone just like starts crying is like, call it, there's nothing wrong with you. Right. right. Meaning you can still have issues and work through it, but you can't say that's why I'm not married right. because there's tons of really dysfunctional people that are married. Some happily, some not. So, right. So, it, so th th then we have to shift the mindset and say, oh, well, this is actually maybe by design because through this process of struggle, I'm going to become my greatest self. And I want it to end tomorrow. But that's really the, the I think, the more accurate mindset mm -hmm. of having gone through it myself personally and having seen hundreds of women do it, mm -hmm. that, that it's really a purpose that's laid out. Mm -hmm. You know, um, It's like a purpose and a journey that's set out for you to become your best version of yourself. And that's different for each single. I don't think it's the same, yeah. but it's a different way of looking at it, that it's on purpose and you're not just forgotten. Cause yeah. I think that that's the biggest loneliness is I feel like I'm a never loser. Like I'm a loser. I'm by myself. Like everyone else is married. I'm, I'm by myself. I'm not lovable. I'm, you know, I've been left out somehow of society. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm yeah. And I think there are a lot of crises of faith that come up along with that. Yes. And my perspective is always like, well, we have to validate that. And you're allowed to be angry and you're allowed yeah. to be that and you're allowed to not understand and you're allowed to be upset that you don't understand. And I tell people this all the time as well. Like even if you're having a crisis of faith, that's okay. And the, the point is that no matter how, which way you cut it, if this is happening for you in your life, you either go into that hopeless state that you were talking about that victim mode or you say what do i need to learn to deal with my to, to deal with myself to do with my own life forget god for a second maybe you're not a believer maybe this has caused you such a crisis of faith that you don't want to be a believer that's okay too and and even with that you owe it to yourself to go through whatever phase of life you're in with self-love 
without self-judgment, without beating yourself up and, and with taking care of who you are. So I, the first thing you do with people is you help them shift what's not happening for you in your own life that you need to, first of all, figure out for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. How are you not, how are you being there for yourself or not? Right. You know, and then as a byproduct, you'll see a shift anyway in your, in your immediate world. Right. You know, so yeah. yeah. And they feel so empowered when they see that shift as well. It's like, Oh my gosh, it's real. I'm like, what, yeah. what, what, you know, like they don't believe it till they see it. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, that's, that's incredible. And I, I think, like I said, like, it's just such a validating experience because so much of this pain is hidden and yeah. people are expecting to just have to say like, Oh no, it's fine. Like it's going to happen one day or I'm going to find somebody someday or it's all going to work out. It's like, you don't have to feel like that. You're allowed to be upset. You have to validate that part of the experience too. Yep. Oftentimes being able to go into that space and work through those emotions, it opens up everything. And your relationship with your faith is a relationship like anything else. Mm -hmm. That's a part of your dating story too, that we need to take care of it. And any relationship, and I'm sure you could speak more to this, you know, about like in your own marriage and your own relationships that you're in right now, anger and distance and upsetness, like it's all a part of it too. And it's what you do with those feelings that matters. And it's not just completely shutting down and t tuning out, but being able to bring those feelings to the surface and deal with them. Yeah, exactly. And then be able to process them. So that's exactly yeah. what I'm passionate about, which I think where we overlap a little, yeah. is teaching people that you, how to process themselves. And <laughs> once you learn those tools of how to process yourself, you're, you're free. You're not trapped by anymore. It's so liberating right? Yeah. To know I don't have to be scared of my feelings or I can just connect with my feelings and let them move through me and they're just going to leave and they don't define me. It's not yeah. who I am. Yeah. And so I think people are really scared of feelings. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. You see that a lot. And, and it's like, I think there's, um, there's sometimes like this notion for people who've been bottling it up for a while. If I start to open that pressure valve, even a tiny bit, the feelings are going to be so overwhelming. I'm not going to be able to get out. Right. Which right. Close the pressure valve even more. Right. I push them down even more. And when that happens, they obviously grow bigger and we ourselves and our strength and our confidence grow smaller. And a lot of what I do is I empower people to feel all of the emotions. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I will sit in this with you. I'll do this with you. You do not have to do this alone, but you have to show yourself that you can do it mm. and feel it and you can process it. And I think what you're saying is so true. When you get to the other side, it's just like a magical thing. It's like, wow, I had this really good cry. And my life problems have not been solved, but somehow I feel a little bit more grounded and a little bit r more real with myself and with, you know, mm -hmm. the around me. Yeah. It takes that pressure off the holding on. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, so I trained in somatic psychotherapy, right? Which is slightly different to the DBT, CBT. Yeah. I mean, I trained in classical psychology and then I sort of went into that as a specialty because yeah. I fell into it because I had such an experience that well, and I'd be curious to hear your experience with anxiety around this, because it was really about anxiety that yeah. I, was, I was in my early twenties and I was experiencing some anxiety. Cause I know tonight we're technically trying to also talk about anxiety, yeah. um, trying to stick to script a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I remember I experienced anxiety and out of nowhere, out of nowhere, I just started experiencing anxiety for no reason, like supposedly. Yeah. And, um, and I ended up in one of those personal development courses that I did because I was just curious about it. And in there, they did a somatic component, a body. Somatic means body, body oriented. So it's so like body focused experience. Yeah. And my, my father had passed away about five years earlier when I was young. Yeah. And I thought I grieved it. I thought I'd work through it and whatever, but obviously not. Obviously part of me had, st had stored up stuff. And I remember in this course having this complete release with the support of the group and whatever, whatever, in, in a, a cry in a way that I'd never cried. And literally the next day, my anxiety was gone. Wow. Now, I don't think it was an anxiety disorder. I yeah. don't, but I, the anxiety I was experiencing disappeared with the release that I was stored, had stored up inside myself. And I was so blown away by that. I literally went to go and study somatic psychotherapy after that. It was fascinating how the body stores the feelings in the body. And then if you go in through the body, also you can then access your subconscious, which is where it's coming from and then be able to release it. Yeah. And so I, I don't know, that was just fascinating to me. And so I think there's a difference between managing your anxiety and then trying to deeply get to the root of it underneath yeah. and release it. And I think you can not, maybe not everyone, every time, but you can, you can yeah. get to the feeling like that. Yeah. 
absolutely. And, and people are so scared to do it. They're so yeah. scared because it hurts. And I think we have to, we're all working together to kind of undo this notion that if something hurts, it means it's wrong. Yes. So, and it's like, no, something uncomfortable means it's uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean that it's actually wrong. And feeling right. it can get you to the other side. And the only way to get to the other side of anxiety is to actually feel the fear. And that's what I do. I do it a little bit differently. I incorporate some somatic work when people really, when it's really showing up in the body. But exposure therapy is really the same thing. When we do exposure therapy for panic or social anxiety or dating anxiety, all of that, what we do is we first get to what we call the focus of apprehension, right? So we get down deep, 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 deep. Okay, you're afraid this. I and mean, if that were to happen, what would happen, right? Until the root, which is so deep, which is usually a statement about ourselves. Well, maybe it means I'm unlovable or maybe mm -hmm. the world will reject me or maybe it means that I'll, that I'm not actually capable of doing something or maybe it means I'm imperfect. And if I'm imperfect, that means I don't have a spot in this world because somehow, some way that's what I was taught. And then once we get to that root of that fear, then we go ahead and we face it head on, mm -hmm. face it head on. And it's like, we have to talk back to that fear, but not only in our head, but also in our actions and our behaviors and our belief system. We have to try to bring out this different side of ourselves that's a lot stronger and that's not bound by the fears that our childhood or other people's opinions have kind of like placed upon us. Mm. So you really take them deeper, deeper through the subconscious. That's how you get into the subconscious is a different way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I always tell my girls, like my ladies that I work with, you got to find a therapist who can actually help you access your subconscious rather than just conscious talk therapy. Yeah. Because that's useful to a degree. There's insight mm -hmm. and awareness, but it, it's limited. Yeah. You, know, you don't get under those layers. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think that that's awesome. And maybe let's talk a little bit about how anxiety shows up in dating or yeah. maybe people watching can also put type in the chat, how they have seen anxiety show up, whether it's for them or for other people, like, what does it look like when you're dealing with anxiety and dating? You know, such a broad question because I think we experience it so differently. Um, I think there, I would, I would categorize it in a couple different ways. Mm -hmm. The first one is like a really existential one. I'm not going to find that person, right? There's going to be, there's not going to be somebody out there for me. Um, yeah, expecting the worst, right? Like these like bigger picture access, I'm going to be the only one that's left behind. Yeah. More existential, bigger picture kind of dread, like knowing the future thoughts. Yeah. Um, and there's something, yeah, like you were saying, like there's something wrong with me. Th these really like bigger picture, like thinkings. And then I think there's more specific anxiety disorders that show up in dating either with social anxiety, right? I mm -hmm. can't be my authentic self in, in front of somebody else. Cause what if I'm not accepted? What if they reject me? yes very closed in and very shut off yeah exactly yeah. um and then i think this is also less commonly known about and some people call it controversial but i've seen it in its truest form which is relationship ocd where people get really stuck on any part of uncertainty around a relationship and that uncertainty will pivot like first i'm like hyper focused on this one thing that feels wrong and this one thing that doesn't feel right. And then I'm checking myself. Do I, am I really attracted to them? Are they really going to be the right one? And it's like over and over and over again, which can also be a paralyzing experience in dating. Yeah. I, oh. so funny. I just heard that term today for the first time. Oh, OCD. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. With focusing on one, on one aspect, you know, and just keep going over and over and over it. And sometimes it jumps from aspect to aspect, but the, the common denominator thread is I can't handle on like an uncertainty yes. uh, within a relationship or sometimes it can look like being like overly jealous um, or overly unsure about exactly how something feels. So I say that all because anxiety and dating can show up in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage people to talk about their dating lives like in therapy because it is so like if you're dating and right now your mission is to like find your person and whatnot, it can really be like the most debilitating part of life. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. I mean, I think that the, I think generally also it comes from a general feel, that the general feeling is feeling unsafe. I just feel unsafe. Yeah. I feel unsafe. I'm going to be rejected. Fear of rejection is the biggest thing I see with my women dating and they're terrified of rejection. Yeah. They're so anxious. They're going to be rejected. Yeah. And it's like, what, what are you so afraid of? What does rejection mean to you? Yeah. 
what is going to happen if you are rejected and let's face that and then how do we empower you to not care if somebody else's opinion rejects you right let's focus also, or, or it's like if i'm rejected i feel unlovable that's really where i think it goes yeah however you and i both know that it's really how they're judging themselves already and so I, I've had a number of messages over the last couple of months where women go, oh my gosh, I went out on a date after the course. They did the course. They learned how to love themselves. They learned how to not care about rejection. They learned because they're accepting themselves. So if you accept yourself, who cares if someone rejects you, right? Completely. And so they learned that and they went out and they went, oh my gosh, I went on a date and he, it wasn't, it was terrible. It wasn't even for me, but I didn't care because I felt so good that I couldn't believe this is how I feel on a date because I've never gone out like this. They were so excited that they never felt this way before. Yeah. They were like, oh, the date was terrible, but like, yeah. I don't care. It was hilarious. <laughs> I, I was just loving it because that's what it should look like when you're not living for someone else's validation or opinion of you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And like, I just think we've got to give, we just, we just don't know our own worth, Eliza. <laughs> Jackie, preach. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we, I think we don't know our own worth. When I think about the most confident person in the universe, they walk around like floating in this bubble of self-love. So they're like, if somebody even remotely tries to pop it, they're out of my life, you know? And it's like, right. it's not even a relevant part of my story. If somebody right. tries to pop my own, you know, like knowledge of my self-worth and that that's not something I need to prove. It's not something I need to create. It's just here. Nobody takes it away from me. Right. It's mine. It's just my own essence. Yeah. It's, it's isness. Exactly. It's as true as my first name. And it's my God given right. And I just, I literally woke up like this. Okay. And I'm worthy. And that's it. And if for whatever reason you don't see that in me, even if I saw potential in you, okay. How do you help people tap into that isness? Isness or, or worth? Both. Your isness is worthy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so how do you tap into your isness is worthy? That is a great question. And I think first of all, helping people recognize that worth is not something that needs to be created or, or proven. Mm -hmm. You were born with it. Yeah. Tell everybody like, babies love themselves. You didn't walk out of the womb hating yourself or looking for somebody to approve of you. You got out of that womb, you start screaming. Like somebody take care of me. Okay, and I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and I need to be changed and this and that. And you just, you walked out of there, you loved yourself. And when you were a kid, you also loved yourself and the whole world revolved around you. Yeah. Somebody along your story may have gotten in there and may have taught you a lesson that your worth is attached to something else or that you had to prove it or they made you feel badly about yourself for whatever reason. And we have to recognize something that that was somebody else's story that they put in your brain. Right. That's not the story that started in your brain. And when we're able to, what we call like externalize that voice and say, somebody else told me I'm unworthy or this story made me feel unworthy. Then we recognize, okay, my worth is actually in here. It's actually happening right now. Mm. Externalize whatever it is that kind of got stuck in our brains. And we really go back to who we are and what we're made of and what we love about ourselves. And then that becomes the story that we play in our brains over and over again versus somebody else. So you get to help them separate from the old, from that story, the negative story, and then kind of rewrite the story. It's like a narrative kind of therapy or uh, re yeah. rewriting. Yeah, I mean, it's recognizing you were worthy all along. Somebody or some story in your life, and maybe it was a terrible story, put this thought in your head that you were not worthy. Let's externalize that because it's not real. And right. get back to who you actually are. And once right. you find who you actually are, you can let those thoughts fill your brain and your behaviors. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah. I, I more spiritual perspective, I guess, where this is where the spiritual aspect comes in, where we do soul mode, right? Where they, you come, you come from, you're tuning into your higher self, which also, I think, is just free of that story. It's free of those old stories. Yeah. So it's like a different way in, I guess, to yeah. to feeling that that neutrality of like I can be compassionate to myself and I can just observe what's going on with neutrality and that observer mode. Yeah. Um, very powerful because it creates a vessel for any other trapped stuff, whether it's in the body or whether it's a story in the head, you can kind of loosen that and just move it through you or drop it, you know, drop it, get it out of your space in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a very mindful approach, right? Yeah. 
one of the first laws of mindfulness is being able to observe. Why? Because when I can observe something that's happening in my head or in my body or in my behaviors, I first of all recognize that there is me, the observer, and there's what is being observed. Right. Which is the spiritual, you know, it is a spiritual way of looking at it. Um, but the, the observer, and I always ask people to think about this, is always like a cool, calm, and collected version mm -hmm. of yourself in your head. It's like yes. the empowered part of us. And I often ask people to think about this, like what would the most empowered version of yourself do here, either on this date or with this guy or with this girl? How would they act? Then mm -hmm. you the person, and that's how we elevate ourselves. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Um, people are asking good questions. We're missing everything, Jack. Okay. Let's, let's, let's look at a few. <laughs> okay. Any good book recs for attracting a healthy relationship? I always tell people to read the book attached. It's my favorite. Yeah, me too. Um, do you have any recommendations? Deeper dating by Ken page. Okay. Phenomenal. I haven't heard Phenomenal. that. Phenomenal. Calling in the one calling in the one. Do I have it here? No, I can't remember who wrote it. Calling in the one and deeper dating by Ken page. It talks about how to date from that deeper place rather than like, you know, that kind of graspy, yeah. I've got to, I've got to do the right things to get to attract a guy like yeah. it's kind of deeper, deeper in yourself. Yeah. Deeper okay. by Ken page. Um, so one of the questions that comes up a lot is how do I deal with this like loneliness when I feel like everybody else in my life is moving on and finding their person and I'm not, how do I deal with that loneliness? How do I deal with that? Like all of it. It's very hard. Um, what I did and what I recommend is, which it doesn't always work. It's not like if you do this, you'll never feel lonely, right? That's not, but the way to generally make sure that you don't drop into from loneliness to the pit of despair, which is the danger, the danger is dropping from I'm feeling lonely to that deeper depression, despair, yeah. um, giving up resignation. We don't, that's what you want to avoid. That's poison. It's poison, right? Yeah avoid that like the play. So the way to do that, to avoid that is to make sure that you have some areas in your life that you're giving mm. when you're in a place of strength and you're giving to someone else that needs you, which is so many people need you. Yeah. So many people, right. Yeah. They need you, your help, your company, your capabilities, whatever it is, right. Then you don't, you just feel connected. You feel connected and strong. I remember. And I, and I really had this hop when I was in Australia and I was helping my mom, she should uh, have an Aaliyah. She, she passed away a couple of years ago, a year and a bit ago, but she, um, I, I was trying to help her get into an assisted living. This was years ago and it was so hard and so difficult. I wasn't even living in Sydney. I was living in Israel and it was very, very stressful. And I was kind of broken by it. And I remember at that same time, all of a sudden someone called me and said, can you teach a class in our apartment? And I was like, I'm not working here. Like, no. And they were like, please, I'll organize the whole thing. And it was obviously God like orchestrating things to like force me into a different mode. Yeah. I said, okay. And so I went and taught this class and I was so energized and I was so kind of back to myself all of a sudden because I'd felt a different part of my strength. And that experience taught me something enormous, which is everyone has strengths. Mm -hmm. Everyone makes a positive impact in the world. And if you can, even when you're lonely, even when you feel like no one loves you, even when you're isolated and you can get out of that to go and help someone, it, it's about it tapping into your strength, right? Yeah. And that is very energizing. So that's, that's number one. Number one, I would absolutely say that. And number two um, would be to make sure that you have love around you, oh. meaning little kids, unconditional love and little kids giving you hugs and kisses. It's, there's nothing like it. You cannot spend a few hours or a couple hours with little kids who just adore you unconditionally and come out feeling as lonely and depressed as you were. You just can't. Like, hear that, yes. I used to do that all the time. I have like five, I would say I have a five-year-old best friend. Like yeah. I, I would have like literally, no, it was oh, three-year-old. My best friends for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so doing that kind of stuff and being around people that you can just be yourself with, yeah. like be yourself with, um, I think is really important. So those two things I think stood out for me as things that got me through and brightened my day. Yes. Self-care. Yes. Self-nurturance. Take care yeah. of yourself. But I think people know that, yeah. but these two things aren't as obvious yeah and i think that they helped a lot it's amazing and i'm sorry i'm going to rapid fire some more questions at you but how, how do you think people can deal with like when the hopelessness does set in or this thought or this kind of like narrative 
it's just not going to work out for me. Like I'm the odd one out. How do you help people through that? So we know that that's like a self-sabotage voice or a Yatsahara, we would say in Judaism, which is a, like the, the internal inclination of self-sabotage and, and, dis, and spiritual destruction. Um, so in that place, there's a concept, very interesting. Some people say it's just never going to happen for me. Like it's not my mazal, All right? They talk about my mazal, my, how do you, how do you, I don't know how you interpret that. The literal interpretation is flow, but it's like, it's oh. just not in the stars for me. Like, not in the stars. It's not my, it's not my not, destiny. It's not my destiny. Yeah. yeah, it's not my destiny. To, I'm going to be alone forever. I was going to be alone. I was going to be a cat lady. I was going to die alone in my apartment and no one would know until the stench got so bad. That's really where I went, like legitimately. Tacky. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I do, that's where I get it. Like, that's where I went. Yeah. Well, thank so, you for the concept that what if it's not in my mazal, what if it's not in my destiny that I get married? And from the Jewish point of view, again, the Jewish roots are that your mazal is always in response to you. So mm -hmm. as you shift, you cannot blame it on Mazal or your destiny because your destiny responds to you as you shift. Wow. Even if, God forbid, it was decreed at some point that this was your destiny, you can't even hang it on that because as you've grown, it changes. Wow. Right? And so it is a very oh. powerful idea. Powerful. Totally. Because you're trying to kind of say like, well, it's just not in my control, so I'm going to blame it on something else. or I'm just... Which is makes sense from an emotional standpoint it's way less painful to think about it that way but the solution is in bringing it back into your own sense of control and and knowing that you know loving yourself and loving yourself in any mission or goal in life is about being able to say this is my responsibility yes my responsibility and and it, it will change meaning people like to try to judge the future and conclude that i'm not yeah. going to get married because they can't handle being out of control. But what's more effective is if you say, it's okay, I can sit in the unknown. I, it's better to sit in the unknown than jump into the future for control and conclude the worst. Oh yeah. So we go to control, right? Because I can't handle the feeling of the unknown. So say I'm, I'm in the unknown, I don't know what's going on and God, you're in control and you know what's going on and this is really hard for me and pour out those feelings of hopelessness to a higher power. The only thing we can do in that moment of despair and, and hopelessness is to either turn towards God, a higher power or away if you're spiritually inclined. If you're not, I think it's very, very hard. I think it's very hard. I would say call three friends, like have three lifeline friends that you call and go, this is my lifeline, All right? Like call a friend, um, um, meaning connection. You need connection. Connect whoever it is, whatever, whatever you believe in. Yeah. To others or to a higher power or whatever it is. But get out of that mode of isolation. You've got to get out of being alone, number one. Um, it's very hard to stay miserable and depressed if you really have connection. Um, that would be the first thing I would say, you know. And that we have more power over changing our state than we realize. Yes. Getting up, going to exercise, having a shower, listening to music, you know, like whatever. There's lots of things that change our state. And so those things are like basic coping, you know, managing things I'm sure we, we've all talked about before, but it's hard to remember in, in that moment. So sometimes I say three lifeline friends, also three lifeline friends if you're going to call an ex in that lonely moment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't call the ex. Right, exactly. Call the ex because that women, particularly because we're a vessel, when we're with a man, we become a vessel for that man. And so it's like literally, literally, we cleave to that man and become a vessel for them to make a bell to receive. And so when we're lonely, we go back to the last place that we were receivers mm. and natural. It's, it's natural to do that. Yeah. And natural, that's why it's natural to go back to your thinking about your ex and whatever. Right. Even though you're like, but why? I know it's not right for me. Why am I doing that? But you're kind of torn. Yeah. And again, it's okay to do that, but call three friends before you call that ex and tell them in advance that you need them to remind you why this is a bad idea and why it didn't work out for you guys. Yes. Right. Everyone's reacting to that, right? Yeah. Everyone relate? Does everyone relate? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's also so validating. The reason why you have an urge to call your ex or to call the last person that really you felt like you were connection. experiencing love with, right? It's because the connection is so normal and we feel so good when we're in it. And it, there's right. nothing shameful about wanting that. And there's nothing shameful about having an urge to reconnect to the last person that you felt that way with. And at the same time, and at the same time, right? It's like, and at the same time. And then we bring ourselves back to the moment, what's gonna work for me now? And how do I have to elevate myself to the next level to put my, to put my love and to devote my love to the thing that's actually gonna be right for me?
Yeah, like if you just think, okay, what will I feel tomorrow if I do this? Or yep. if you just jump into the... See, why do we jump into the future when it's negative, but we don't jump into the future when we need to? Right. Like, yeah. We could jump into the future and say, if I call my ex, that's going to be a disaster. I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to regret right. it. Not doing it. Right. But why, why don't, we don't do it then, but we only do it when it's like worst case scenario. Isn't that interesting? Well, because we want our thoughts to uh, match our emotions, right? We don't like cognitive dissonance. So when I have an urge for connection, I will tell myself any story so that I can go ahead and find that connection. Yeah. And justify, rationalize. And rationalize it. Boom. Right. That's what I'm going to do, right? That's probably a good idea. It's like, no, deep down, you know, that's really not a good idea, but I'm doing it anyway. It's justifying the heart's desire for that want, for that connection, that moment. Yeah, because, it's, because loneliness and disconnection, I think, and I truly think this, are two of the most painful experiences in the world. And our system will do anything to get us out of those feelings, even if it means doing something that we don't... That's bad or for really you. ...is going to be good for us. Right. Um... Okay, I'm just looking at some of the things we wrote down yeah. before. Do you think it's possible to live anxiety-free? Well, anxiety is a human emotion. Well, I should say this. Fear is a human emotion. You will have fear if you are going to be a human, right? That's right. kind of par for the course. It's the same way that we have to have sadness sometimes. Sadness is the emotion of grief. It helps us, it helps us process things that we've lost, right, or things that we didn't end up getting that we wanted. So the emotion of fear is not negative in and of itself. The same way sadness or joy or love is not negative in and of themselves. That being said, anxiety is like this like kind of like cousin of fear. It's mm -hmm. all future oriented. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really get us anywhere. And it's like fear that gets stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we recognize that fear is just a human emotion and at times we're going to feel it and that's okay. If we know how to navigate it, it becomes just like, anything else in the world it's like the sun rises and the sun sets i'm right. gonna this big class to you know to a thousand people and the emotions of, of fear is going to kick in so be it so when we know how to navigate our fear and we know what to do with it when it happens it's just like anything else in life it's like breathing when we don't know how to navigate our fear and we let it take over us and we interpret fear as something that is like massive danger signal or i need to get control of the situation or uncertainty equals danger that's when fear turns into anxiety. That's when anxiety becomes dysfunctional. And that kind of anxiety, yes, I do think that we can work through. That was yeah. a good answer. No, but it, it needed a nuance like that. So, so do you think that anxiety is typically about the future? Anxiety is, is almost always a future-oriented unknown. Ooh, anxiety is... Aliza Shapiro, anxiety is... <laughs> future-oriented <laughs> unknown. I love that. If you think about any of the anxieties that you have, right? Even if it's about a past memory, it's about how is this past memory gonna haunt me now, right? Or who's right. gonna out about it? Or what did I do to ruin that relationship and something else is gonna blow up? So it is almost always about a future oriented unknown or something yeah. you don't have certainty or control over. Yes, yes. And the way to feel certain in the face of that uncertainty is, drum roll. Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. Drum, I'm drum rolling. <laughs> focusing on what things are within your locus of control and letting go of everything else that's outside of it do you uh -huh. know from locus of control yes yeah but other people might not so you can okay so the locus of control is basically anything that i actually anything that's actually within my domain or realm of control in life i got to give my 100 percent to and everything that's outside of my locus of control i have to give 100 percent of my energy to letting it go mm, nice when I let it go and it's uncertainty, it's in the ether, it's somebody else's business and it's somebody, like, somebody else is gonna make that equation. I give 100% of my energy to bringing my full self to a date. But I let go of how anybody else is gonna react to me because that is not within my locus of control. Right. Or worrying about what everyone else, what, they, what he's thinking, essentially. Because that's how anxiety is out. It's so worried about what they're thinking that they're not worried about how do I feel about him. Right, they're right. They're more worried about how he's feeling about right. me. Right. right. Exactly. So whenever you're thinking about like, what is the other person thinking of me? Did I mess it up? Right. Or any of those thoughts that are, are about things that are just plain and simply not in your control, then it's typically anxiety. And that's something that you have to work through. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not you have to live with at all. Right. And not, that's, and not in any area of your life. Well, that's, that's uplifting that yeah. you can 
uh, that, that we can just get rid of that. Yeah, I see that too. When when people connect with themselves and come back into the present and ground and yeah. stay, you know, how am I feeling? What's going on in my world? Um, but that's how you started, right? You said, when I help people who are struggling in relationships or dating or loneliness, I first and foremost tell them they have to turn inward and do exactly for themselves what's missing. That yeah. is your locus of control and letting literally everything else go. That's when our worlds end up opening up. It's a magical thing. So it's interesting. We're both working the same way with completely different semantics and yeah. different concepts, but it's kind of very similar. Yes, 100%. 100%. Awesome. Okay, well, it's been awesome speaking to you. Should we wrap up or take some questions? What should we do? Anybody has questions that we didn't miss, you can definitely add them here. But if not, I encourage everybody to reach out to Jackie if you think that she could be helpful in your own life and in your own journey. She's an amazing mentor, friend, colleague of mine. And I'm so happy that we got to reconnect here. Me too. Can't wait to speak more to you. Yeah, let's like actually organize a time to catch up now. <laughs> Sounds perfect. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a great sure. night. Okay. Bye. Thanks for Bye.